Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Meanwhile, speaking of the great state of Texas, one of the spectacle in the state legislature this week is the beginning of the impeachment trial for Attorney General Ken Paxton. And let's start with a clip. This is testimony from Ken Paxton's former top deputy. I believed that he potentially could have been subject to blackmail. And as a result, he was taking illegal actions on behalf of what we then knew was a campaign donor, but he was taking actions on behalf of Mr. Paul. You believed he was being blackmailed? At one point, I actually believed he was being blackmailed, sir. So you, you, you didn't think he was committing a crime? You thought somebody was committing a crime against him? At one point in time, I believed that, yes, sir. If that's why you went to the FBI? Well, eventually we went because I had tried on several occasions to have, as I think in one of my memos says, that you probably have on here, I said, asked him, I mean, I really wanted him to come clean. I even said, are you under undue influence, sir? And he said no. He did say no, yes. Benet, this is a long and tangled story, but I'm hoping you can give us a sense of what are the allegations against Attorney General Ken Paxton and how serious does the evidence seem? So the evidence seems very serious and it is a tangled story, but the core of it is that donor to Ken Paxton's election in 2018 asked the attorney general to reveal information from inside the attorney general's office that related to a federal indictment of that donor. So this donor's name is Nate Paul. He struck up a relationship with Ken Paxton, donated $25,000 to his re-election campaign. And the main charge is that for some reason, Ken Paxton decided he wanted to help out Nate Paul by giving him documents that he had received from the federal government that related to an investigation into Nate Paul. There are then other allegations that stem from this relationship. The House impeachment team in Texas suggests that Nate Paul paid for a renovation of Ken Paxton's home, and they also suggest that Nate Paul hired Ken Paxton's mistress at some point. And so there's a variety of misconduct alleged. So those are the initial claims. After that point, what actually led the House in Texas to begin the impeachment proceedings was that Ken Paxton fired some of the whistleblowers inside his office who tried to call attention to his improper relationship with Nate Paul. And then Paxton then went to the legislature and asked for $3.3 million to settle a lawsuit that the whistleblowers brought against him. So first there's the corruption, and then there's the retaliation. Of course, Ken Paxton denies all of this, and it's going to be up to the senators in Texas to weigh all the evidence over the course of the next few weeks, most likely, and then come to a determination of whether they think he's guilty of the allegation. What is the threshold in Texas for removal of office or barring someone for office? And do we have a sense at this point of how those votes could potentially break down in the sense of, does Ken Paxton look like he has enough allies in the state Senate to survive this, or do we have any sense of that yet? Right. So Texas, like the federal government, has a two-thirds threshold for convicting a political office holder who's been impeached. And the Senate has 31 seats. And so that means there will need to be 21 votes to convict on any of the 16 impeachment articles for Paxson to be removed from office. And they could then take a separate vote to decide to bar him from any future office It's very hard to determine whether they're likely to meet that threshold. Of course, it's interesting in such a small chamber, only 31 members, and in a state legislature where people know each other, almost all of these politicians have some relationship with Ken Paxton. And he's a very prominent political figure in Texas. He's nationally known. He's brought a lot of high-profile lawsuits against the Biden administration. And so he is someone who exerts influence and is going to be able to lean on these senators in one way or another to vote to acquit him. It's difficult to know where the chips fall as of now, but for some evidence, we can look to some of the pretrial motions uh, before the actual proceedings began in the Senate. On Tuesday, the defense filed several motions to dismiss some of the articles of impeachment, and they were unable to succeed on those, and enough senators approved them to suggest that there is at least a large group of Republicans in the Texas Senate who are 
willing to hear all the evidence and potentially willing to vote to convict if they're persuaded by it. Alicia, what do you make of this? I guess my thought is that this kind of process is particularly important in one party states, because in states that are closely divided, the Democrats and the Republicans are a check on each other, keeping each other honest. And in states that are dominated by one party, it does seem like those are the areas where you have issues like this arise because part of the dynamic may be that party members are more reluctant to go after one of their own. And so another example that comes to mind is Mike Madigan, the former Speaker of the Illinois House, who ruled the Illinois House with an iron fist for decades before finally getting charged last year with racketeering, I believe. And he is going toward a trial in 2024, I think. And a criminal trial like that, unlike an impeachment process, is one where there's a presumption of innocence until proven guilty. But it is notable that it seems like it's these one-party states where you see problems like this crop up. And that's partly because they're less likely to draw primary challenges, especially when you have someone like Mike Madigan, who was also the state Democratic Party chairman, who kind of could also dole out political favors to his cronies and build support that way. The same thing happened If you recall, in New York with Sheldon Silver, who ultimately was indicted, he was the former New York State Assembly member who was indicted also on some corruption charges. And if you recall, Andrew Cuomo, now he wasn't indicted, but he had a couple of his former campaign manager as well as a couple other donors were indicted regarding the Buffalo Billion Dollar scheme upstate and there was some alleged pay for play. Now, this is Supreme Court ended up actually overruling the and vacating the convictions, the ruling that the fraud charges that were incorrectly brought against them or wrongly brought against them and that the prosecutors had stretched the fraud laws. Now, I think the impeachment is actually a better way of handling this than actually, you know, uh, criminal prosecutions now, because this actually puts it up, in a sense, in voters' hands, rather than trying to stretch the criminal laws to try to prosecute behavior that may not be illegal in all cases, but definitely is unseemly. And so I think in Texas, this is a much better way of dealing with it. But as to your point that this often occurs more in one party states, yes, because, uh, as you noted, you know, members usually don't want to punish their own friends and voters are usually are often kind of look the other way. But in this case, I think some of the allegations that uh, against Paxton are so unseemly that I think they need to eventually or hygiene reasons, as you mentioned, they need to, you know, defense straight him and deal with this to actually repair their own standing. Because in Texas, actually, you know, we think of it as one party state, but some of the elections in recent years actually have been very closely contested. You know, Ted Cruz hasn't been winning in the landslide. He has an election coming up and Democrats are actually making ground in some of these races. And the corruption issue could actually be very potent for them. So I think the Republicans actually have an incentive to deal with the Paxton and actually show that they're dealing with Paxton by impeaching him. Thank you, Alicia and Manet. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.